legal drama surrounding P. Diddy has gone out of control, you guys. And it kind of starts to feel as though there's a little bit too much chatter going on and not enough research. And that's why I decided to invite one of my favorite YouTube lawyers, Stephanie from Wine and Chill on the channel so that we can go over all of the rumors that have been surrounding Diddy um, and some of the new information that has come out as well, just to make things as clear as possible and as accurate as possible for you guys. Stephanie, thanks for joining me on my channel again. Thanks for having me, Grace. Excited that we're delving into this because given everything that has been reported in the past week, not all of it is matching with the court documents. So even I was a bit confused as to where the heck people were getting information from. So. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You know, and it's so, so, so amazing to be able to speak to a lawyer about this because it's hard for, you know, other entertainment reporters like myself to be able to understand exactly what is going on in these documents. You have to have a certain legal eye for these things. So it's really important, you guys, when you're consuming content about legal matters to make sure that at least a lawyer has been consulted on some level about the information that you're receiving, because otherwise um, there will be some misspeaking potentially and things like that. That and it can get rather confusing. So one of the most confusing aspects of this Diddy lawsuit is the role of Ethiopia Haptimerian. So she had been reported as being Diddy's chief of staff, his right-hand woman and everything like that. There were claims that she was going to be testifying against him, but it turns out that that's not exactly true. Can you tell us about that, Stephanie? Yes, I think people got a bit confused because there were so many defendants named. And because again, when we talked about the original complaint, the original complaint was drip written a little sloppily. Ethiopia Habertimerium has never been Diddy's chief of staff. That honor or dishonor, to be quite frank, goes to someone else. And actually she has been a music executive for many years, specifically at Motown Records um, under Universal Music Publishing Group, UMPG. And she was promoted to the president of Urban Music slash co-head of creative at UMPG. And then also given the title of president of of Motown Records. So that is her role. And because Diddy's Love Records, um, which is a, which I think is also interesting. People think of Diddy and they think of Bad Boy Records because that's the original record label. When he released the Love album, he made a separate record label called Love Records, which that is woven into the storyline, but that adds a level of complication. And essentially they entered into a distribution deal with UMPG. And that is where Ethiopia comes in. Their overlap is less than six months long. And so that is, I would say, the nexus of the confusion. Exactly. And, you know, uh, Ethiopia did release a statement about all of this that I want to read to you guys out should help clear things up a little bit. She released a direct statement to all hip hop and it's a direct quote. It says, I am informed and believe that Mr. Blackburn has falsely represented to various social media sites and other media outlets that I agree to testify against Mr. Combs. This is completely untrue. I have no personal knowledge of any alleged wrongdoing by Mr. Combs, and there is nothing I could testify to that would be against his interest. Being falsely accused of criminal conduct is deeply upsetting to me. I did no wrong. I never saw or participated in any alleged racketeering enterprise, and I never saw, aided, or abetted, or tried to conceal any ex-trafficking activity. In short, there is no basis for any of the claims asserted against me, and I should never have been named a defendant in this lawsuit. My counsel provided a revised declaration that addressed the topics that Mr. Blackburn addressed and corrected his false narrative. I am aware that Mr. Blackburn found my truthful version to be unsatisfactory to him, and he presented yet another version that again presented a false narrative. So she's not only defending herself, but she really wants to make sure the public knows that she feels as though the lawyer representing Rodney, who brought forth mm -hmm. this um, lawsuit, is leaking information to social media, misrepresenting information, and purposely misrepresenting the facts of what actually transpired. So how do you feel about her scathing statement? 
I think it's necessary because one thing that is definitely happening and the and most important thing to know is what is the role the lawyer is currently playing. So this lawyer specifically is Rodney Jones' lawyer, who's the producer who came forward with the allegations that he was assaulted, that he was coerced into numerous um, situations, and that he witnessed various examples of ex trafficking as well as drug trafficking. He is suing in civil court. Civil court, what you receive in civil court is restitution. So usually restitution can be numerous things. So if somebody has squat in your house, restitution can be getting your home back. Restitution more often than not in civil court cases is money. Civil court mm -hmm. is completely separate from criminal court. So the attorney in the civil court case, their entire goal is to get the best restitution, in this case, the most amount of money um, for their client to make their client whole because that is how he's being paid. It would seem to me, and this is what I said the, the first time, that this lawyer is a little unscrupulous in that they do not care if their goal completely um, maligns and causes issues with a potential criminal investigation. Because the people involved as victims in the potential criminal investigation, those are not currently his clients. So anybody who is a victim of ex trafficking that is not his client, he doesn't stand to gain anything, which is why um, the case has been haphazardly handled this way, to be honest, in my opinion. Um, and again, it does a disservice to all of the victims, including his. So mm -hmm. I think it's important that Ethiopia said something to at least set the record straight because we have two concurrent, actually more than two, multiple concurrent issues going on. The only um, lawsuit that was ever closed was the Cassie lawsuit was settled within one day. And there was another lawsuit brought by two Jane Doe's. I believe that one might have also settled. There are currently, I believe, up to five civil lawsuits currently going on in a potential criminal investigation that is separate, that is over here. And potential criminal investigation, Department of Homeland Security raided two of Diddy's homes. One can assume a criminal investigation is coming, but they are currently not um, on its face working together. But mm -hmm. instead, places like TMZ have just taken facts from a civil complaint and inserted them as if they are facts of a federal um, criminal charge, which we don't know that yet. It might be that they are commingled most likely, but currently right now there are no facts to support that. And does Ethiopia or do any other co-defendants who feel like Ethiopia, um, do they have any recourse at the end of the day? Because in being named in this lawsuit and being accused of criminal activity, that has mm -hmm. to at least slightly damage their reputation, whether it be professional or personal. Oh, of course, like defamation comes to mind. You intentionally knew that this was false and you went forward with this anyway. Um, if there are breach of contract claims, if there are any contracts between love records as well as Motown records, various things. I don't think because again, like this is a record executive. This is a music executive. She's been in the music industry when I checked for a few decades. Um, she's been doing this for her whole life. I'm sure she just wants to continue to do her work. Mm -hmm. um, and that is not related to this. One of the things I thought was interesting in her statement is that she pointed out that the attorney, which I believe his name is Tyrone Blackburn, um, yeah. is the attorney for Rodney Jones, um, that he was not satisfied with the statement she made. I think it would be helpful for us to pull up the statement because I have seen TMZ, for example, larger places pull up parts of the statement and then make the incorrect assumption that she's automatically testifying against Diddy. It seems to be from her statement, it's not that she's against testifying, it's that she's vehemently saying, I don't know anything. I don't know that man. We worked together very loosely for six months. What would I have known? You're saying this person is um, culpable for crimes for the past decades. I've known him for six months. I don't actually know anything. So like, why is my name in it? And I think mm -hmm. that, you know, that deserves to be said. That doesn't mean that he isn't guilty of the crimes. That's not what she said. She just said, well, I'm not, I don't know anything about it. So this is actually a waste of time. So I have um, the declaration if we want to go over it. Absolutely. Let's go over it. Okay. 
And while Stephanie pulls that up, you guys, I want to remind you that Stephanie has her own amazing YouTube channel where she provides legal commentary on a variety of entertainment news, political news, you name it. So do definitely make sure to check out her channel. It is called Wine and Chill. I've tagged her in the title of this video in the description. There's going to be a link to it as well. So make sure to check it out and support her channel. Got it. Thank you, Grace, for that. So this is the declaration. And there also is another document from Tyrone Blackburn, who again is the lawyer of Rodney Jones, who filed this complaint and then the amended complaint that we talked about with Grace a few weeks ago. And essentially in that document where he is writing to the judge, he lets the judge know that they will be receiving a declaration from Ethiopia Habertamerium. And because of that declaration, they are dismissing all claims against her and that they have entered into an agreement with Ethiopia. Now, what I find really interesting is the implication of saying you've entered into agreement with somebody is usually like, hey, we settled with this person and that's why we're releasing them of claims. That, I don't think that's exactly what happened because according to Ethiopia, she's like, I never knew anything to begin with. If anything, she might have released her claims against Tyrone Blackburn and saying like, hey, I'm going to sign this declaration so that way I won't sue you because why was I even in it? <laughs> so this is... Um, We'll go through it a little bit. This is a declaration which is now in the amended complaint, which states her name. And here's her employment history with UMG, which is Universal Music Publishing Group, UPMG. Um, UMG is just Universal Music Group. It's one of the largest record labels here in the US. She started there in 2014. Um, oh, sorry. She started there in January of 2023. So again, this is a 20 plus year career that she built for herself. And then in 2014, she was promoted to president of Urban Music, co-head of Music Creative. February 2014, she was also given the title of president of Motown Records and executive vice president of Capital Music Group. And then in 2001, she became the chairwoman and CEO of Motown Records. So Motown Records became a standalone label within UMG Recordings, Inc. And in that role, she reported directly to Lucian Grange. Lucian Grange is still a named defendant in the lawsuit. Mm -hmm. Now, in 2022, May, Motown Records entered into agreement with Love Records, which Love Records, again, is the other record label owned by Diddy, whereby Motown Records obtained the right to distribute one album produced um, as the love album. So that's it for one album. So specifically, she states, to the best of my recollection, under the license, Motown Records agreed to pay or reimburse Love Records for certain of the invoice recording costs incurred by Love Records in making the love album. That's normal in the music industry. Then she goes on to state, I'm not personally aware of any financial sponsorship by Motown Records of UMG of any of Love Records listening parties or writing camps. To my knowledge, neither Motown Records nor UMG would have organized or run any listening parties or writer camps for the Love album while I was at Motown. She specifically says this because in the allegations in the civil complaint, it states that Motown Records and UMG helped sponsor these listening parties. And the listening parties is where Diddy allegedly was assaulting people and um, causing chaos and commotion. Mm -hmm. She then says, I'm not personally aware of any cash payments from Motown Records or UMG to Love Records or Mr. Combs. Instead, as I said, to the best of my recollection, under the license agreement, Motown Records would have paid or reimbursed Love Records only for certain invoicing recording costs. Since leaving Motown Records in 2022 of November, I have had no involvement with Love Records. So their overlap is literally just May through November of 2022, in which she was the chairwoman and according to her statements would have not had any other contact with Diddy in the capacity that the original civil complaint was alleging. So in your opinion as a lawyer do you think that it was a little bit malicious on Rodney or um, Tyrone Blackburn's and to I see you to, <laughs> to list her in this lawsuit knowing that she only had six months of overlap and that she did mention that there were some times where she definitively really wasn't there. I remember reading this morning mm -hmm. she could name the places that she was with Diddy for the few times she met him. She said, I met him one time in a recording studio. I met him one time in his back patio and I met him one time in this other place. Like that's it. So was it malicious of Rodney to throw her in there? So I wouldn't put any blame on Rodney. So Rodney Jones is the producer as well as the person um, who is the victim with his allegations, allegations that have 
a decent enough corroboration for, to be quite frank. The blame goes again with the lawyer for wanting to pull in high profile names to get more eyeballs onto um, this lawsuit for his client. I think mm -hmm. one of the really interesting things that should be noted if we look at the timeline, when the complaint originally released, this is I think three weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago now, the main focus of the complaint was not the RICO allegations in the complaint, was not the ex trafficking. It was people, and I pointed this out, it was people wrongfully because of homophobia be pointing and being like, oh my gosh, Diddy is, oh, what is that? And ignoring the complaint. Now that the complaint was amended last week on March 27th, and that amendment coincided with a federal criminal investigation that Tyrone Blackburn has most likely not helping with or if he is is causing commotion just from from my observation of the practice mm -hmm. um a completely separate federal investigation you see two raids on diddy's house because of those two raids it's bringing more light to this civil complaint that is a separate thing from the cr um, criminal investigation currently so i think it has been completely um very sloppy at best, but at worst, a bit harmful to somebody who Ethiopia in this instance is like, I don't even understand besides me being literally the boss of somebody's boss's boss. She's the chairwoman. She's in charge. What does she have to do with these specific events um, that she herself is like, hey, my calendar is right here. You can look at my calendar where I am. Um, so I think that was unnecessary on their, on their end. I think what's interesting is when you read the declaration, UMG and Motown Records are also defendants to the civil complaint. They have deep pockets. These are record companies, etc. Her statements basically also um, excuse UMG and Motown Records of saying, hey, he's not even our artist. We signed a deal with him for one album. We don't know what that man is doing. We're just here as distribution. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's why the attorney, it's not particularly favorable for um, Tyrone Blackburn and his team, because she didn't provide any information that says like, yeah, you know what? I'm not culpable, but Lucian is. She didn't say that. She simply said, well, I don't know anything and I don't know what you want me to know that I don't know. Ah. And that's such a great point, because again, that is something that she said in the end of her t uh, testimony, or sorry, in her statement to all hip hop is, listen, my... Declaration is unfavorable to him, but it is the truth. And so when mm -hmm. you look at this long list of people that um, Rodney Jones has listed as defendants, or sorry, his lawyer, Tyrone Blackburn, there is Sean Combs, there's his son, Justin Dior Combs, there's Ethiopia, there's Lucien Charles Grange. Um, and then you see Love Records, you see Motown Records, you see Universal Music Groups. So it seems like um, Ethiopia's statement there kind of helps absolve it's not you know certain yet but like certain other people who are in this defendant list so it gets kind of chopped down from like eight or nine defendants to four or five five or six or something like that so that is rather interesting um since we're talking a little bit about the other lawsuits going on right now as a reminder there's the tyrone blackburn lawsuit cassie already had her lawsuit sub mm -hmm. settled in less than 24 hours and then there are about two jane doe lawsuits and mm -hmm. then we're also aware that the feds raided Diddy's homes, the home in Beverly Hills and the home in Miami as well. So how might these lawsuits coincide with the raid? Did they inspire the raid because of all of these allegations? Like, what do you know about that? Yeah, so basically what we know is that we don't know a lot about criminal investigation. However, Homeland Security just does not randomly pop up at your house because of hearsay, usually. Usually they build the case for many years. It just happens to coincide that Rodney's civil case is coinciding with the fact that Homeland Security has decided, well, you know what, if he's getting this civil case, li likely this is um, a guess on my an educated guess. Because Diddy settled Cassie's case within 24 hours, and then he received this also credible case, despite the way it's written, the allegations are credible, um, credible case now, Department of Homeland Security may be thinking, well, if he settled that other case in 24 hours, this case is also corroborating what Cassie's case is saying. And it's taking a step farther and it's naming other people's names in here as well. We don't want him to destroy evidence. So let's go conduct our search warrant while we build continued evidence. And then we will issue actual charges if that's what we're going to do. 
Um, I think that's currently what we're watching. And particularly one of the things that I think is just um, not good media practice for what it's worth is certain other blogs of like TMZ, Shade Room, etc. just pulling facts from the civil complaint and assigning them to the federal case. The federal case will be written much better and will be a much more exhaustive list because when the federal government comes after you, for better or for worse, um, they ha document in a manner where they keep much higher levels of receipts because when you are in a criminal case, the burden of proof is higher versus in a civil case, you have, um, preponderance of the evidence so like more likely than not did you assault this person in a civil case is um depending the burden of proof there are different levels for the burden of proof but some of the burden of proof is um oh gosh now i forget hold on let's let's pull up for rico what the burden of proof is and we'll just edit that rico burden of proof. sure no problem and you're so right i didn't even think about like the burden of proof you need there versus in civil <laughs> exactly We'll just say there's a higher burden of proof. Mm -hmm. Oh, so for criminal cases, there are varying levels of burden of proof depending on what the actual charge is, but they are all higher than civil cases. So for example, um, if you murder somebody, unfortunately, the burden of proof is beyond a reasonable doubt, much higher than preponderance of the evidence, which you have in a civil case. So that's currently what we're seeing right now. I think what we're gonna continue to see is since it is the Department of Homeland Security, they are not going to release any information until if and when charges are also being filed. It'll happen at the same time. Because basically, Diddy is, I would assume they are also assuming that he's a flight risk. So what is the purpose of releasing information before being like, okay, to the chokey with you? <laughs> Absolutely. And you mentioned that they might have started investigating him years ago. So typically, yeah. how does... How does this timeline work? What tips the feds off to you running some sort of a ring like this? And what happens from when they raid you to when they charge you? Like, what does that yeah. look like typically? No, that's a great question. And I think um, we have a clip um, from ah. R. Kelly's lawyer. I think this would be like a good time to show that clip in that when we are looking at federal charges, they follow um, usually not always the same playbook because, you know, cr criminals are generally to a certain level, somewhat smart well, since they've scammed for so long. Um, but I think they can give a little bit better insight into, you know, how this might look. Great call. Let's take a look at the clip right now. As new details surface into the investigation into two of Diddy's homes, Fox 5 is getting an up close look at the sex trafficking case against another high profile hip hop artist. All right, Fox 5's Lisa Everett spoke with former federal prosecutor who helped send R. Kelly. She joins us now with more on what goes into a case like this, Lisa. Well, Stephen and Natasha, there are signs today the investigation involving Sean Diddy Combs may be further along than we thought. A former top federal prosecutor says he may be looking at a RICO sex trafficking case. This comes as Diddy breaks his social media silence but makes no reference to the legal issues on the horizon. Sean Diddy Combs posted beautiful photos of his youngest daughter on his Instagram with the caption, Happy Easter from Baby Love. The adorable images are a sharp contrast with the investigation he's facing, one so intense it prompted raids on March 25th on his Miami and Los Angeles homes. They have now conducted two public search warrants of two homes. That's a significant step in any investigation. It means they have probable cause to believe a crime has been committed and that they'll find evidence of that crime in those locations. Combs has categorically denied any wrongdoing in five civil lawsuits, as well as the sex trafficking case. The home raids signaled a critical turning point. It became clear a major federal investigation was underway, says former federal prosecutor Nadia Shahada, who successfully prosecuted R. Kelly in the RICO sex trafficking case that put the R&B singer behind bars for more than 30 years. It suggests to me that the investigation is well underway. Um, you need more than just kind of allegations to convince 
two different federal judges that you have enough for a search warrant. And so that suggests to me that they've probably spoken to multiple people. Amid the social media frenzy surrounding the Diddy investigation are unproved allegations going back decades. Shahada says the typical statute of limitations for adult sex trafficking is 10 years, but a RICO charge would change that. Each of these uh, crimes can also be charged as predicate acts under RICO, the racketeering statute, which would significantly expand the statute of limitations applicable and you could go back decades. The next step is for prosecutors to present the case to a grand jury, which could decide to indict Combs and others or dismiss the case. I suspect that they may have already started presenting evidence to a grand jury or potentially putting witnesses before a grand jury. Now, we reached out to the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York, which is coordinating the investigation, and they declined to comment. So there you go. It looks like they might even be presenting to a grand jury to get that indictment rolling in. I'm still a little bit shook, though, because um, I just I want to know how this starts. Like, how does something go from a criminal complaint to raids to grand jury? Yeah. RICO charges. Like how many criminal complaints does it take for something to be qual quantified as RICO or trafficking? You know what I mean? Yeah. So this is actually, I did a deep dive into this on my Patreon. And one of the most, I would say alarming things about this entire case about Diddy is these allegations are not only not new, they're decades old. So in 2001, he was acquitted for a nightclub shooting, that famous shooting that everyone remembers when he was dating J-Lo and um, he had forced J-Lo to carry a um, armed weapon in her purse. And she was like, oh, I'm not, I'm not doing this with you. Like, this, is, this is commotion, mm -hmm. etc." cetera. She and he charge for it. He, exactly. Mm -hmm. And Shine, who was signed to him, is the person who went to jail. The mm -hmm. woman that was shot, she very vehemently for the past two and a half decades has always said, did he shot me? I know I looked in the person who shot me, looked in my face. I, she said it to the doctor. A doctor got on the witness stand and stated, hey, my patient said this is the person that shot me, etc." He was acquitted of that crime. Mm -hmm. That is the first case that he was acquitted of where a, a victim was like, so are you, how, how did you get off? When right. I identified you, I had a, a reputable doctor who confirmed my surgery, identify you. She has recently been on TikTok stating, I've been saying this for 20 plus years and mm -hmm. people have discredited me. People have stalked me. People have tried to bully me. People have slashed her tires, according to her, all of this. And I believe that's probably the beginning. Um, there's actually a case before that, which is much less known, and it is before he was um, as large as he is now, where he was the promoter and the organizer for this event in a basketball gym. I think it was like either high school or college basketball gym. And because they wanted to look like it was more busy, they locked people into um, the gymnasium. And unfortunately, people were rushing to get in to see the performance. It caused a crowd crush and almost a dozen people unfortunately passed away. No charges were filed, etc. Um, however, then you have years later, then you have the shooting incident, and then you have multiple other incidences and people largely continuously. There were people um, that he allegedly went to college with that filed reports and said, hey, this person assaulted me, etc. That is probably when the feds have probably been building a case for many, many years. Mm -hmm. And now that it's coming to light, I think because according to the former prosecutor, um, what she was saying like, oh, you're seeing the ramp up in the public eye because you see the raids on his house. My um, educated guess would be the reason why it's coming to light so quickly and the timing is they want to make sure to preserve evidence, mm -hmm. uh, which is we need, which would coincide with one of his alleged employees who was very much so arrested last week for drug possession under the guise and the assumption of, oh, most likely they are going to use this person to testify against him. That person, um, that assumption is largely based on people seeing that in the civil complaint, that um, young man was labeled as allegedly a drug mule. 
He was uh, arrested for low-level drug possession, which I thought was really interesting, versus distribution. Um, that could also be a federal tactic of, hey, we will give you the low-level possession charge instead of the distro charge if you cooperate. Mm -hmm. So we are currently going to see how all this plays out. So I would say at least a decade, if not two decades, a good and I'm a good as in one to one example, but it's not a good example because the example I'm going to bring up, in my opinion, is a, an abuse of the RICO statute is mm -hmm. the Young Thug um, case that's currently going on where you see RICO being used against disorganized crime for what it's worth. <laughs> <laughs> Rico is supposed to be against organized crime. What mm -hmm. Diddy is as alleged to do is very much organized crime. Mm -hmm. Taking people across state lines, um, allegedly um, taking narcotics across state lines, facilitating um, wild amounts of violence across state lines. That's that's organized crime. Like that is mm -hmm. the definition of organized crime. Um, in the Young Thug case, it's not exactly the same. But if you compare the timeline of events. Mm -hmm. In terms of what the prosecution in that case is doing, they had allegedly been watching um, this posse turned maybe street gang-esque for years, for what it's worth. So I think that can be a comparison of just showing the fact that these are always years long probe. This is not, mm -hmm. oh, just because Rodney Jones and hired Tyrone Blackburn to file a lawsuit. Now the feds are looking. That's not how it works. Okay. So I want to go back just to touch on something because when you talked about the mule for uh, for Diddy or his alleged mule, mm -hmm. his name was Brand Brandon Paul and he was named in the Tyrone Blackburn lawsuit. So mm -hmm. are you saying that um, the feds, they had already had an eye on this whole entire organization, so they didn't need yeah. him being named there? Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I believe so, for, for mm -hmm. what it's worth. Because it's also interesting that Brendan Paul is not in the original complaint. He's in the amended complaint with pictures um, mm -hmm. and specifically in because I have both. So if we go to the original complaint, just to fact check myself. <laughs> we always need to fact check. And again, you guys, Stephanie's got an amazing YouTube channel. It's called Wine and Shell. I've got her tagged in the uh, title of this video and in the description as well. Please do make sure to check out her channel where she provides her legal commentary as a professional lawyer on today's entertainment news tech news, political news, you name it. Definitely check out her channel, Wine and Chill, here on YouTube. And if you're enjoying this stream, definitely do make sure to give it a thumbs up so that our videos continue to pop up in your algorithm, you guys. Um, sometimes YouTube can kind of hide videos and whatnot, but if you interact with them, if you leave comments, if you like videos and whatnot, they will show up in your algorithm more. So interestingly enough, so to correct myself and fact check myself, interestingly enough, in the original complaint by Tyrone Blackburn, Brenton Paul is mentioned in the original complaint as a drug mule, again, allegedly with one picture. In mm -hmm. the amended complaint, he is mentioned over 13 times with multiple pictures, including a, um, four new pictures, one of which he is allegedly holding said narcotics mm -hmm. as so. <laughs> and I think that's interesting in um, the timelines of while I have been adamant that the way that the complaint was filed was unnecessary in terms of this should have been a lot cleaner. If it was my client, you're supposed to take your client the utmost seriousness. It was written in a way that caused unnecessary commotion, but to get a lot of attention for what it's worth. Um, which is because I think of the general messiness, I assume that. Tyron Blackburn is not necessarily working with the federal investigation. He mm -hmm. might be in a very limited capacity because I think it's interesting that all of a sudden this person who is now also um, being arrested for drug possession is now mentioned in a much more detailed manner in the second complaint. So to maybe me, I when I, what was that? Sorry. I was like, maybe I will amend that. <laughs> so to me, when I hear that, the first thing that comes to mind is, it feels very media driven, you know, like you're seeing this in the media. It feels very media driven. And I wonder if that can hurt the credibility of this case that they're building up right now to be playing that playing that way. Because I believe even in Ethiopia statement saying, no, I am not testifying against Diddy. I barely know the man. She's saying that 
she's accusing Tyrone of planting stories to the press and misrepresenting things. So when you've already got uh, a defendant saying this about you, and then it's kind of seeming like you're playing off the press and stuff like that by amending this lawsuit, it's looking a little off, to be honest with you. I would say regarding the civil complaint, it had to get amended anyway. So we can pull up the clip of me saying like the amended complaint is coming soon because it's written so <laughs> sloppily. Mm -hmm. um, but I wonder now, if I think about the timeline, I wonder if the complaint was written in such haste because Tyrone Blackburn assumed that the federal investigation was going to become public soon. I wonder if that, but also how he would not know that. So I want, you know, to give him a little grace since I've been a little stern. Um, mm -hmm. But one of the things that I think is interesting about Ethiopia's statement is she's definitively saying, I am not testifying in this civil complaint. She's not saying anything about a potential federal criminal investigation that if that were to go to trial, she has no choice. The federal government, if they wanted to, could compel her to testify. That's completely separate. She's only saying, hey, I'm not cooperating with this civil defendant because I really don't know anything. And do you think that Diddy was blindsided by this entire thing, the raid and everything like that? Or do you feel like he kind of had an inkling that something was coming at a certain point or, mm -hmm. you know, sooner? I think to be honest, there's a level of hubris in people that do such high level crime for what it's worth. There's a, mm -hmm. there's a huge level of hubris and making an entire career because your alleged best friend um, passed away and you're going to monetize on it, um, which I always found very disheartening and fascinating for all the wrong reasons. One of the things that people have been pulling up is that I believe last year he made this big display of how he was giving back the... Um, masters and the rights to the music to all of his former artists to which anybody who knew anything about music was like well these are basically worthless masters now they're not going to get any streams from them these are old school music which listen i love the old school music so you know hopefully y'all get a couple dollars off of me but it's not in wide circulation so you basically took up all their royalties and all the money they deserve and are like here i'm giving it back to you but it came with very ironclad NDAs, which Aubrey O'Day vehemently said, that's why I didn't sign it. Like, mm -hmm. I'm not gonna get anything for it. And now I also can't talk about you and I can't say what I want to say or what I've been wanting to say for years. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that maybe that timing was him trying to garner a, a little bit of public goodwill because there are always gonna be those people that are like, oh, you're trying to take down a good black man. I'm like, stop. <laughs> Everybody has been saying for many years, wow. this yes. does not qualify as a good man. I am telling you. Hopefully naive, you know, maybe people were like, mm -hmm. well, he's just a partying man. But there is no way now with the facts have been there for a hot second, but there's no way now with the facts press up against anybody's face for anybody mm -hmm. to save the serious face. Oh, this is a good, what do you mean? This is a nice man. He has been accused of at a basic level um defrauding and taking advantage of his music artists for years mm -hmm. that if and he had been accused numerous years when he was dating cassie of abuse where people would see her and say something is not right there and this is not um anything new and i think for him to claim that he's blindsided i think is just his level of hubris of He's in his 50s. I believe he's like 55, 56. Yeah. This is decades long, awful predatory behavior that he's gotten away with. So maybe he was blindsided that he's not allowed to, you know, act with impunity. Right. It's a uh, Bill Cosby vibes. Bill Cosby made it to what, 70 something, able to get away with this stuff until it all came raining down at a certain point, right? Um, I want to talk about like the pyramid. Ever since you spoke a little bit about um, this being organized crime, immediately my head goes to a pyramid. You know, like in those movies about like uh, the Italian mobsters and stuff like yeah. that in New York and New Jersey, there's the lead guy, then there's all the other guys. So who, how do you think the pyramid is working out in their kind of minds right now or in their boards in Homeland Security or with the FBI? You've got Diddy on top, you've got mm -hmm. the mule somewhere, the alleged mule. Um, mm -hmm. And then 
what else is there? How many people are you expecting to be charged in connection with this case? What people are you thinking are going to be called to testify? Because in talking about Aubrey O'Day, I'm thinking she's definitely going to be someone out there. We talked about the woman who claimed that Diddy shot her in the face. I think she's going to be called. Like, what are we thinking here? Mm -hmm. So his actual chief of staff, according to the complaint, um, is Christina Corum. She's most definitely being called um, and she may also be on the receiving end of charges. So we'll see about that. Um, I think one thing that should be stated about former and current employees is that there is a level of workplace intimidation, workplace control over employees as well. So I don't believe that those specific direct employees would likely be getting charges as they've probably likely also been abused. Um, you have, unfortunately, he has groomed his children um, into this lifestyle. So specifically his sons, um, Justin Combs, as well as what is the other son's name? One second. They're calling him King these days, which I'm kind of surprised about because his name is something else. Christian, right? Christian. So there's Christian and there's Justin. Um, the one that is, I think Christian. I think Justin is the one that is 30 years old. So like these are not these are not young children. These are adults. Um, mm -hmm. Also is allegedly involved in assaults as well as Justin Combs. So I think you're going to there also see them. There's allegations that they also were put in charge of underage ex trafficking allegedly as well. So I think when you're looking at the totality, unfortunately, um, Diddy has seemingly roped his children into a very disgusting predatory lifestyle unfortunately which is why i find it really disheartening sad disgusting but also just like heart-wrenching for his little child who's like two years old who doesn't and he's just using her like oh let me put it on instagram terrible i felt so repulsed when i saw that those photos she's a gorgeous baby truly beautiful but the baby. fact that he's yeah, the fact that he's using her to deflect from all this nonsense is just really, really mm -hmm. selfish. It reminds me of Tory Lanez going, he pulled his child out of school so he could do his little pap walks with him uh, for the courthouse and stuff. These people truly have no shame. No. Steph, a little bit earlier, you mentioned an NDA. So mm -hmm. let's talk a little bit about what an NDA is, what Diddy's NDA look like. Was it a little bit more predatory than your typical NDA and how that might factor into people, um, you know, looking to testify or being called to testify in this case? Yeah, it's very interesting. So there's an NDA attached to the amended complaint that was not in the original complaint. And it's quite short. It's about three pages long. So nothing... Um, you know, not abnormal about that. What I did find really interesting and that is very abnormal is it states in terms of the term of the NDA for in section three, the term of this agreement and duty to keep all information confidential and not use prohibited material shall commence on the first date above and continue for the life of the artist, which is Diddy, plus 20 years or 70 years, whichever is longer. Which that is very abnormal because what are you possibly doing that you don't want people to talk about for 20 years after you die or 70 years in totality because you think you'll get away with it? And how that long is a red flag. Mm -hmm. And how long are they typically to NDAs? NDAs usually last. So if you enter into like a corporate NDA, it usually lasts the amount of time you work at the corporation. So like as an employee, plus they'll put one to five years. Mm, so this is a huge departure from life. That. Yeah, <laughs> life plus 20 years is it's giving um what was his name? Prince Philip when he died that his will is sealed for 100 years plus 70. Something something obnoxious because there's mm -hmm. things in there that, you know, the colonizing crown doesn't want us to know. <laughs> Which I hope, you know, his love children just come out of the woodwork anyway and embarrass him in the death. So. Oh, the children with Penny, Penny Natchball. <laughs> His Allegedly. cousin. <laughs> Allegedly. Yeah, yeah. So speaking of NDA, in the settlement that Cassie won from him, um, it's assumed that there is some sort of a non-disclosure agreement. So how would that play out if the feds wanted to call on Cassie to testify? Yeah, so when you settle, there's usually a non-disclosure agreement. And in that, if you are the plaintiff in civil court, there's also a release of claims. 
So specifically, Cassie most likely would have released Diddy of any claims having to do with sexual harassment, sexual abuse, ex-trafficking, etc. And a release of claims means she cannot go to the local police station herself and say, hey, I have been a victim of X, Y, and Z. However, her releasing the claims is separate from a federal investigation where the federal investigation, if they're looking for Diddy for ex trafficking and RICO charges, where they would say, well, it's not only Cassandra Ventura who was a victim of ex trafficking, it's Cassandra Ventura, it's Jane Doe A through Z, it's all of these women. So we are going to compel her to testify about what she knows about ex trafficking. What would likely happen, because they would most likely do that, is Diddy's lawyers would then say, no, that is a violation of our agreement. You are upending contract law. We have a contract. She's releasing of claims. And they would basically have a huge motion argument. So they would file various um, opposing motions, arguing the legal parameters of whether or not they could compel her to testify. I think a judge would allow her to testify for what it's worth. Mm -hmm. I, I would think hope so. the states are the stakes are so high I think a judge would allow her to testify and say hey this occurred to me for over a decade um this is what I saw this is the harm that I have been subjected to mm -hmm. I truly truly hope that that is the case because I do believe that Cassie deserves to have that money paid to her but also to be able to speak her truth if that is something that she wants to as well I don't like that um victims would have to choose between one or the other mm -hmm. you know so I really do hope that that's the case if she wants to do that and I'm looking forward to hearing more about all of this I know that in the video we played earlier they said that don't be surprised if they start presenting things to a grand jury trying to get an indictment soon so you guys stay tuned you know there's going to be some news there's going to be some more updates coming up about this and don't forget um it's really important to make sure that you are getting your news from a credible source that's why i had to call stephanie to come on here to explain some things to us stephanie is a lawyer i'm not so um when i'm reading legal documents i'm doing my best but it's nowhere near as good as an actual lawyer. So, so do try to make sure that, you know, when you're reading things, if it's on TMZ, that or the other, make sure that they're saying that a lawyer told them this, that, or the other, not just some random person writing or whatever, really try to make sure. Otherwise you are going to be, you know, potentially um, reading or parroting yourself what might be considered fake news, you know? And that's why it was so important to have Stephanie on this channel to clear things up because a lot of the stories going on right now, they feel kind of clickbaity in order to continue mm -hmm. to garner views based on things that have already been shown or this, that, or the other. Um, so I really just wanted to make sure that things were clear with Stephanie on the channel. So again, th Stephanie, thank you so, so much for joining us. Um, you're amazing as always to have around. Um, and to everybody, do make sure to subscribe to Stephanie's channel. It's called Wine and Chill. She She's tagged in the title of this video. She's tagged in the description of this video. Make sure to watch her videos, subscribe, and support, okay? Take good care, you guys, and we'll see you in our next updates. Bye. Thank you, Grace.